Hi, thanks for joining us and welcome to the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. There's an old saying that April showers bring May flowers. And if you install a rain barrel, you can reuse that water, help the environment and save some money. You can also save money by using fertilizer and other garden chemicals properly. And that's what we're talking about today on the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. So stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Chris Mason. Chris is the stormwater engineer for Shelby County. And Mr. D is here. How's it going today, fellas? It's going good, very going good. All right. Before we get started on rain barrels, we have an email and a photo from William. This vine comes up all over the place, usually through shrubs. Currently, I try to dig up the roots, and that usually breaks it early in the process. What is it, and how do I get rid of it? Well, Mr. William, that will be your air potato vine, okay? Common relative is the cinnamon vine. You can crush up those leaves, and it smells like cinnamon, okay? Mm -hmm. It has a tuber root system that looks like a potato, so hence the air potato vine. Has the glossy leaves, heart-shaped leaves, very invasive. It's a huge problem in Florida, okay? It's a <laughs> non-native, came this way from Asia, okay? Grows are pretty prolifically, all right? Doesn't have any tendrils, so it uses your shrubs for support. Fences, trellises for support, okay? Um, and as far as getting rid of it, what do you think about that, Mr. D? You know, the only thing I can think of, uh, other than mechanical removal, <laughs> you know, going down and finding that tuber and digging mm -hmm. it up, is uh, is probably using one of the glyphosate materials, mm -hmm. uh, Roundup, uh, something like that. Of course, you got to be very careful if it's, uh, you know, in your shrubs and in your desirable plants. And uh, one of the little tricks that I've learned in the past is to put on a pair of rubber gloves, and then put a pair of cotton gloves over your rubber gloves and dip uh -huh. that hand in a concentrated solution right. of the glyphosate and just kind of wipe it, rub it on the plant. Or you could, I guess you could use a paintbrush or, yeah, or some, other, some other way like brush. that, small brush, mm -hmm. anything like that. Any, any way that you can concentrate, uh, you know, that material just on the plant that you want to kill because glyphosate for the most part is non-selective and it will kill anything you put it on. All right, that's good info. Okay, again, very invasive, so you definitely want to get rid of it. Actually grows in full sun and moderate shade. Yeah. All right, so there's your air potato vine, Mr. William. Thanks for the question. All right, Chris, why put a rain barrel in your yard? And you know what, rain barrels are popular. Everywhere I go now, people are asking about rain barrels. So why do we even need rain barrels? Well, we ask that question in our new workshops, and the, and the answers uh, that we get from the uh, attendees that usually break down into two different categories. Uh, the first one is your uh, environmental reasons. Uh, okay. Rain barrels work because they reestablish the uh, natural hydrology. They use the water where it lands, uh, right there at the source, rather before it be turns into runoff. Okay. And that uh, prevents uh, flooding downstream, erosion, uh, and pollutants from being picked up, uh, you know, such as sediment, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and uh, all the nasty chemicals <laughs> like you know oil and mm -hmm. trash, hydraulic fluid, brake dust, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then one thing we don't really think about is thermal pollution. And right. th as the rain hits your hot roof and goes down the uh, concrete and down the black uh, asphalt driveways and stuff like that, it picks up a lot of heat. And if that goes directly into the streams, that can really cause uh, harm to the environment too. And then the second reason is personal reasons, of course. Uh, uh, it saves money. Uh, you don't have to pay for that water. Uh, but it saves you money in a different way, too, because your sewer bill is based off of your water bill. There's not a separate meter for your sewer. So if uh, you're saving water by not using water in your house, then you also don't get charged the sewer bill for it. 
uh, and then of course that's a good source of water that doesn't have the fluoride and chemicals mm -hmm. put in it mm -hmm. which can actually uh, harm the plants over a long period of time and concentration and, uh, and nowadays it just like you said it seems to be the coolest thing to do yeah, a garden's a not complete thing. unless you have that rain barrel in it so right well, yeah like so. I said we're getting a lot of questions about the rain <laughs> barrels because a lot of people came to your presentation and I understand that you sold out of a lot of your rain barrels that you brought yes we had the uh, spring fling event and we actually had 20 rain barrels that we made up <laughs> Okay. And we're able to sell them for the hardware, $24.50, but we sold 21 of them, uh -huh. and we only had 20. So I had to uh, get, get rid of our demonstration barrel, so wow. making a new one up right now that you have. Uh, Pretty good, huh? Mm -hmm. All right. It's also a good way to recycle barrels. Isn't it? That's right. It, mm -hmm. it saves the environment that way. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we go about putting together a rain barrel? And I know we have one right here. Uh, well, before you put it together, or you, you can buy them or you can put them together, uh, you want to consider what kind of rain barrel you need, where mm -hmm. it's going to go, you know, uh, what you're going to be using it for, how much water you're going to generate. Um, uh, so if you're going to be just doing a couple potted tomatoes or, <laughs> you know, bird bath or right. something like that, um, you want to have a smaller uh, barrel. And you think about uh, the roof area that you're generating from, how much water you're going to generate. And if you've got a big, large area, you're going to be generating hundreds of gallons of water from a typical rainstorm, then mm -hmm. you want to uh, make sure that you're going to have proper uh, place for that overflow to go. Mm -hmm. um, and then you think about safety. Um, you know, a full barrel is going to weigh over 400 pounds. You don't want it someplace yeah. where it's going to get hit and knocked over and, and start uh, crushing things. And um, if you have young kids or grandkids or something in the, in the yard, you want to be able to make sure that it's a safe location. Think about, uh, you know, making things mosquito proof mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just animal proof because little critters want to get in there and get a drink of water too uh, during the summer months. Okay. Now, as far as the mosquitoes go, Mr. Day, I'm pretty sure we could use those BT dunks. Right. You put them in there, it'd be pretty safe, wouldn't you think? Right, you can do that, but if you have it sealed up like mm -hmm. that, I don't think the mosquitoes can get in there to, right. to, to breed. And you know. if you're using an open top barrel, you're going to put a screen over the top yeah. instead of the sealed one like we have here. Uh, they have actually this mosquito-proof screens, and if you go to one of the big box stores to buy a screen, you'll actually see a symbol with uh, the mosquito on it and a slash through it. <laughs> That's the type of screen that you want to get so that they can't get in there. Okay. Yeah. Now, where would people go to buy a rain barrel if they can't get one from you, though? Uh, if you go off the internet, you'll yeah. find hundreds of different sources, and uh, we do cover that in our workshop, uh, all the different kinds. They have some that have plants in the top, and there's advantages and disadvantages to everything, you know, from sure. the wood barrels to plastic barrels, uh, and, and so we go through the things that you want to consider when and, uh, buying the type of rain barrel you're going to get. Okay. Now, how easy it, is it to put it together, though? Because I've got that question, too. Can I do this? Can the average mm -hmm. homeowner do this? So is it pretty Certainly, easy um, to do? Yes, depending on the, the kind that you're doing. But it's basically just a couple holes uh -huh. and some, uh, you know, wrenches and hardware and screwing things together and some putting a little epoxy glue on there and silicone and and uh, it's not really very difficult. Okay, now what about maintenance? What about upkeep? Maintenance and upkeep. Um, basically you want to make sure that you're using the water before the next rain mm -hmm. because if you're not using the water then it's not doing any good. Uh, but basically you want to uh, Check for leaks every time that you're using it, opening up the spigot or something like that. Making sure that it's not shifting, okay. um, because like I said, that barrel's very heavy and it, it's going to want to compact that base. And if it starts leaning or something, you're going to have to make some adjustments. And then basically, uh, at the end of the season, you want to open the spigot, drain it out, right. just don't leave the water in there. Uh, Memphis is a pretty good area. We don't have any real long extended freezes where it's going to break <laughs> your barrel, uh, but you don't want to leave the water in there, so just leave it open. And then. Uh, uh, depending on how many trees and stuff you have in the area, uh, pull out and clean the little filter that's in it and make sure that it's not going to get a bunch of sediment and junk on the bottom. Okay. Now, did you paint this rain barrel yourself? Yes, we did. We <laughs> painted this rain barrel. Like I said, we had a very good event. We sold uh, 21 barrels out of 20. So I had to give away our old demonstration mm -hmm. barrel, and uh, we're making a new one up. And our barrels now are donated by Coca-Cola. Uh. So I am in the process of actually trying to make this one into a Coke can to honor our donated uh, barrels. Um, so uh, that, that's just two cans of spray paint right there okay. and then getting ready. So you're an artist too. <laughs> no, not really. No, not really. <laughs> well, look, uh, are there going to be any more workshops, rain barrel workshops that you know about happening here in Shelby County? I don't, uh, I don't know of any right now. Um, 
I know we, we want to try to get one together. Uh, this is the season, but uh, none scheduled. Okay, none scheduled. One last question, too. And there's calculations as, as far as how much uh, water you're going to get from your roofs. Um, could you explain that quickly, those calculations? Yes, basically uh, you use the square footage of your yeah. roof and that you can actually get off of like the uh, Shelby County Register site oh, okay. if you're in Memphis or Shelby County. Uh, you can look at the roof area that you have and you can measure it just straight down aerial photos or you can go out and estimate it. Don't worry about the mm. slant of the roof because it really doesn't matter. Uh, if it's real sharp pitch right. or a low pitch because what, what goes into the barrel is just straight up and down calculation. So it's basically the square footage and you okay. convert that into a volume to gallons and we have, we, if you go to one of the workshops, we uh, mm -hmm. will teach you the different uh, conversion factors. Um, but uh, basically a 100 by uh, 20 uh, section of rooftop will generate enough water in an average rain to fill a rain barrel. Wow. 55 gallons. Oh, you're pretty good. All right, thanks for the information, Chris. Spring is here, and that means there are all kind of gardening lectures, seminars, and other events are going on all over the area. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D, let's talk about putting nitrogen on our raised beds. Where do we need to start? Time to do that. Uh, well, the first thing, we go back and dig out <laughs> that uh, soil test. That's right. Uh, and uh, if you recall, uh, the soil test recommended that we apply about uh, five pounds of uh, 3400 or 2700 mm -hmm. uh, uh, a nitrogen fertilizer per thousand square feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, we calculated the size of our beds, and I think the largest bed that we have is only uh, 80 square feet. Right. And so when we broke that amount down, and we used algebra that we learned back in, uh, in uh, <laughs> had to break out the uh, math. Well, we had to break out the math, <laughs> and it came to about six and a half ounces of uh, this 3400 that we have here that we need for the for the uh, for the largest bed, and then. For the small beds, both of them are only 32 square mm -hmm. feet, and we only need about two and a half ounces for for the small beds. Small. And uh, the uh, fertilizer comes in 33 pound bags, <laughs> and uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, about all we're going to need for for one of the beds, and, and just a little bit more for the others. But I want to stress that the the nitrogen fertilizer that we're putting out there is only going to be out there for four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not a case of where you uh, a little does a little good and a lot does a lot of good. Because as you mentioned, Chris, if you put too much out there, uh, it is going to leach into the groundwater or it's going to uh, contaminate runoff. the surface water, run off and, and contaminate surface water. So it's very important. And it, and it also can kill plants because mm -hmm. this, is, this is a pretty hot fertilizer. And if you put more than you need, it can, it can damage it. the plants yeah. also. Definitely. But in order, in order for uh, us to get this amount evenly spread over that bed, uh, the way I'm going to do it All is right. put it in a pitcher of water, a couple of quarts of water, stir it up and mix it. The nitrogen is uh, water soluble, so it will dissolve, it will go into solution, and the, uh, the inert ingredients will still settle to the yeah. bottom, and, but it's not, no big deal. So that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to put uh, uh, you know, six and a half ounces of fertilizer on the big beds and, and, and a smaller amount on the other beds. Uh, the soil test indicated that we had extremely high levels of phosphorus, mm -hmm. no, extremely high levels of potassium yes. and high levels of phosphorus. So we do not need to add those ingredients and I would uh, say that we would follow this recommendation, you know, uh, this year and for the next couple of years until we get ready to do another soil test. Okay, this is 3400. 34 so let's explain 00. to the people again what you would mm -hmm. see on a fertilizer bag. That's right, 3400. First number is nitrogen. Right. Second number is phosphorus. Third number is potassium. Okay. Yeah. That's all we need. That's this all year. we need. And, and that's not, it's not going to cost very much, <laughs> you know, not going to cost very much. And, I, and I've got in that 33 pound bag of fertilizer, I probably have enough fertilizer to uh, fertilize these beds for the next 150 years, right? 
Oh, or not, maybe not quite that. Yeah, not quite that. Will you be around to do that? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Wow. So again, uh, let's explain. You're gonna put this watering can or something. I'm gonna. I've got, a, I've got a large pitcher, okay. and and I'm gonna just put it about two. Two and a half, three quarts of water in that pitcher, right. and I'm going to pour this in it, and I'm going to stir it and get it into solution, and then I'm going to walk alongside the beds and sprinkle that water there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would put it in a sprayer, but uh, because of the inert ingredients that don't dissolve, yeah. it would clog my sprayer up. So I'm just going to sprinkle that on the on the beds, and I'm going to I'm going to try to put about half of it out going one way and half of it out going the other way. Right. And then if I have a little left, I'm going to try to put about half of it out. <laughs> Keep putting half of it out until I run out, and that way it'll be pretty evenly spread. To yeah. just sprinkle this dry material out uh, will be very hard to evenly yeah. spread that yes. because if I tried to spread this out over that, what, 20-foot long bed, yeah. I would probably run out of fertilizer at about 18 feet. So that means I've over-fertilized. Right. You know, one end of the bed and under fertilize the other end of the bed. A little yeah. bit of a challenge. Not as simple as putting it in a that spreader and going across your yard or your farmer's field. It's yeah, we're definitely work. gonna see how that's gonna work out for you. It'll work. Okay. Let me ask you a question about the soil test itself. So we're recommending that you get your soil tested every three to five years. So yeah. what do you do in the meantime? Well, you just remember you just remember that the phosphorus especially is very, very stable. Potassium to a little lesser extent. Mm -hmm. But both of these ingredients are very, very stable. And if you have extremely high levels or high levels of phosphorus and potassium in the soil, it's right. gonna stay there for a while. Research has, has pretty much proven that you do not increase yields by having extremely high or high levels of phosphorus and potassium in the soil. As long as you have medium levels, medium levels of, of phosphorus or potassium in the soil, you will get optimum, hmm. maximum yields. So what we're going to try to do is by following this soil test for the next at least three, three years, we're going to try to reduce those levels of phosphorus and potassium from very high and high down to medium. And when we get to medium, we're still okay. If okay. we're at medium levels, we're probably not going to, the soil test recommendation will probably not recommend anything until we get you know, down to low or, or you know, slightly below medium levels. And then we'll recommend then, the, then they'll recommend a complete fertilizer like triple 13 yeah. or triple eight or something like that. But I probably wouldn't follow the complete fertilizer. If, if, if the soil test recommended a complete fertilizer, I wouldn't follow that but over a couple of years probably because you don't want to keep putting that same amount of phosphorus out there from when the soil test indicated that the phosphorus was medium or low because if, or, or because you will build up to high levels again yeah. and, and yeah, extremely high levels of phosphorus actually interferes with the uptake mm -hmm. of other nutrients. And if you have extremely high levels of phosphorus, your plants will look like they're starving to death mm -hmm. when they, they look like they don't have enough fertilizer when in fact they have too much fertilizer. So. Wow, so there's yeah. your lesson. That's right. Soil testing. Yeah, because we don't, don't want to make Chris happy now. We don't want all of that going down. That's right. We don't want to go down the storm right. That's for sure. All right, it's Q and A time. And Chris, if you have comments or anything like that, just jump on in there with us, okay? okay. All right, here's our first viewer email. All right, Mr. D says my asparagus tips are coming up, and I want to know how do you harvest them? Do you cut them when they are the length you want, or do you let them grow and then cut? There's no foliage right now, just the tips coming up. Any thoughts on that, Mr. D? My goodness. <laughs> I'd say cut them when My they're the goodness. tips that you want, you know, yeah. you, you know you, but you don't take them all. You don't t cut all of them. You let some of them grow, grow don't you? Yeah, you uh, definitely want to make sure that they're well established before you do that. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Once they reach like six to eight inches in height, then I'll go ahead and cut them cut off them. or snap them off. Right. And those will be fine. And the thing with asparagus is this. If you're planting them by seed, understand it's going to be three years till your first harvest. Okay. If you're using the one-year-old crowns, you can harvest the next year, but limited basis. All right. Okay. And then you harvest early spring. You usually have a four to six week window uh, to actually do your harvesting. Uh, but yeah, six to eight inches in height, I would go ahead and cut them off, snap them off, cook them up, do what you have to do. That's right. It should be good. You can even pickle them. Pickle them? Pickle them. Asparagus beers mm -hmm. are good. They sure are. I hadn't had that. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Outstanding. Outstanding, huh? <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. That's the first viewer email. Here's the second question. 
I am starting to see lots of ants in the yard. Oh, yeah. How do I get rid of them? And Chris, I just heard you say you too, huh? Oh, I do too. Starting They're to see already. The uh -huh. So, Mr. D, here's our ant man. Yeah, you know, we, we, <laughs> went, we went from having winter that lasted up into spring yeah. to summer. You know, we haven't had a spring. We've gone from winter to summer. <laughs> And in, in less, in, a, in about three days, I, I went from having a, you know, a turkey hunt uh -huh, out in the woods. Right. And I went from having frost on the windshield of my truck in the morning <laughs> to having ticks on me in three days. Wow. I had ticks on me. So, so the critters up. are out. The critters mm -hmm. are out. Uh, the uh, moisture is good and the, the, uh, the temperature is right and they've been waiting. And, and so they're, they're, they're ready to go. So you're going to see all kinds of critters out there. As far as ants are concerned, uh, I would probably rely on the baits and the contact mm -hmm. killers both. Uh, outdoors, uh, there are three uh, baits. And I'm looking at the uh, uh, Insect and Disease Control Guide, uh, uh, UT's Red Book mm -hmm. on Pest Control. And this was re revised in February 2012. But I have three baits that are listed, Spectricide, Ant Shield, Outdoor Killing Stakes, and hot shot max attracts ant okay. bait. <laughs> and then we have some barrier sprays, uh, the bifenthrin RTU, mm -hmm. uh, beta cyfluthrin RTU, and lambda cyhalothrin RTU. Okay. The RTU stands for ready to use. Ready to use. Uh, as always, follow the label directions when you put these products out, and uh, they ought to do a good job for you. Okay, let me ask you about the base. On top of the mound or around the mound or where? Where would you oh, put those So pets? you're talking about fire ants. I'm talking about the fire ants. Yeah, now I'm talking about fire ants. Okay, so now you you're talking this? about yeah. fire ants. Because uh, that question is going to come up soon, but I'm talking about the fire right. ants. Right. On the fire ants, don't put it on top okay. of the mound because the only time the fire ants use the mound as an entrance or an exit is uh, in the springtime after a rain yeah. when the, uh, the reproductives will come out of the mound and they will fly off and, and mate with the queens and all that. Uh, or, or when you disturb it. And when you disturb it, they will use it as an entrance and an exit. The mound, the purpose of the mound is to control the humidity and temperature for the larvae. Right. And uh, they will move them up and down in that mound to keep them, you know, if it's very wet and rainy and hot, Most, the mound gets mm -hmm. big. During droughts, during dry weather, you almost see no mound because they've gone deep. Right. Uh, so the entrance and exit holes are two, three, four feet away from the mound. So you scatter your baits around the perimeter of the mound, and that's where they'll be coming in and out, okay. and uh, that's where the workers will pick up the bait. All right, here's the next question. Can I plant my tomatoes and peppers now? <laughs> yep, I'd say yeah. I'd say stick them about out that there. time. I'd say stick them out there, you know. Our average frost-free date in the Memphis area is... Believe it or not, for Memphis, it's March the 19th, and for East Memphis, it's actually March the 28th. That's our average. Wow. That's the average. Frost free or killing frost? Killing Hard frost. Freeze. Last late spring freeze. So we could have had yeah. them in the ground for a while, couldn't we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. March the 19th for Memphis, and I think East Memphis is March the 28th. Don't now, if do you remember it. in 2008, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, don't in 2008, do we did have that last killing frost. It was April the 15th. Yeah. I just happen yeah. to remember that. It was 2008. And, but and that date is a good day to to use. Tax day, you know, <laughs> once you've paid your taxes and you've sent your forms in, go on out and plant your tomatoes and peppers and you don't have to worry about replanting them probably. Yeah. Now, end of the month, yeah. I think it'd be a good time to get your uh, tomatoes and peppers out. That's right. Chris, do you do any gardening? You have uh, any vegetable gardens? Yes, you know? I do. We have okay. to do uh, uh, potted plants. Oh, potted plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Uh, one last question, okay? Can I use Roundup to kill the weeds in my lawn, Mr. D? We talked about this a little earlier, so <laughs> give us your thoughts on that. <laughs> uh, you know, during the dormant season, you can broadcast Roundup if you have a Bermuda grass lawn, and, and uh, that's labeled, mm -hmm. and, and, it's labeled. And, and you can do that. But now, uh, I probably would be scared to do that. I would. If, that, if the Bermuda mm -hmm. grass is breaking dormant, which it is, to come out there in my yard, uh, then the Roundup will do a good job of killing your Bermuda grass. Yes, too, it will. Uh, probably. So the only way I would use Roundup now at this point is probably spot treat. Uh, you know, treating individual. You know patches of weeds that you want to kill, keeping in mind that wherever you put the Roundup, you're probably going to kill, you know, kill something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, be very careful because uh, I have Bermuda at home. It's starting to come through. Mm -hmm. So I guess a lot of your warm season grasses are starting to so come through. As far as broadcasting Roundup, you, 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 that's gone. You, know, yeah. you don't do that anymore until, <laughs> the, until the winter time. All right. Next March. Next March. Yeah. All right. Be careful with the Roundup. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that.
that's all we have time for today don't forget you can send a letter or an email with your gardening questions the email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 cherry farms road cordova tennessee 38016 i'm chris cooper thanks for watching and be sure to join us next time for the family plot gardening in the mid-south be safe Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.